6.30 Central Standard Time. Time for your favorite two minutes of the week, Mr. Brett Yarborough. I know you get excited about it. Here he is. Hey, guys. Uh, just a reminder that we do have prayer nights leading up to October 31st, the Fall Festival at the Town Square in Opelika. Uh, the prayer nights are at the church. Prayer nights are at the church, uh, usually in the worship center. Yep. They are Monday, Tuesday, and Thursdays. Uh, we're each, uh, we have a different ministry each night that will lead uh, prayer time, and so we're leading up to that to be a special night. So we'd love for everybody to join in, uh, be there, and um, be a fun night. So October 31st is the Fall Festival. So plan on being there. We're going to try to have 5,000 pounds of candy. We have DMX stunt people. We have Pastor Jeff leading worship. We, I'm, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not leading worship. I'm uh, preaching. Preaching. There's a big difference. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. If I lead worship, we might have 15,000 people there. It would be horrible. Well, yeah. <laughs> Everybody loves a good train wreck. So, <laughs> I can play the kazoo. Uh, then we also have, uh, I think there will be some, maybe some things for kids to be involved oh, in. And we got stuff here. So it be a great time. So just look forward to that. A nice safe place. Yep. Fireworks. Fireworks. That's right. Everybody loves fireworks. That's right. I'll turn over to you. Here's my segue. For your kids, your grandkids, your neighbors, your friends, whoever you got, they will get more candy coming to First Baptist at night than any neighborhood they could ever potentially go to. And it's a whole lot safer. That makes sense. So invite all. I know some of you have respective businesses. I've seen posters up. If you want to put a poster up, just let us know. We'll take care of you. Uh, the good news is we're starting to get communication from people we've never heard of about coming, asking questions. And that's a really good sign. When people who have no connection to your church are emailing you, texting you, calling you, saying, I wanna make sure I got the times right, what about my kids' ages, whatever. That means the word is, quote, getting out. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Continue to talk about it, and we'll have a great night that night. All right, so tonight, or today, it's night somewhere. We are in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 23 through 33. And the feel of the Bible study is going to be just a tad di different today. And here's why. Within these verses, and there's not a whole lot of them, there are four statements, four verses that I like to just call hooks. Now, when we talk about a hook, whether that's in your garage, whether that's in your closet, a hook is something that you can really stack some things on. All right? I don't know if you're guilty like I am. Uh, but in my own garage, there are places where I've had some hooks that have actually fallen off the wall because I put so much stuff on it, all right? So much weight. And obviously by the laughter, guys, you've done the same thing, all right? I'm not the only one. Uh, but those hooks provide you an opportunity to put multiple things on, kind of layer it up and keep it in one location. Well, I like to talk about that scripturally at times. There are certain verses that I call hook verses Meaning you can stack a whole lot of stuff on that one. You can just kind of camp out there. Well, there are four of these, quote, hook verses that we have at the end of 1 Corinthians 10. Now, let me remind you, they're not in isolation. We've been talking about this transition of how do we live out our faith as an individual to how we're going to live it out corporately together. We've talked about baptism, the Lord's Supper, food offered unto idols. We're about to, in chapter 11, extensively talk about what we know as the Lord's Supper. Chapter 12, spiritual gifts. Chapter 13, spiritual gifts. Chapter 14, spiritual gifts. And I know you're wondering, why so much about spiritual gifts? Because we mess it up a whole lot. All right? And the Lord wants to make sure it kind of hone us in there. So today, rather than reading an extensive passage, I want to read each of these uh, individually. And then I'm going to kind of address them in kind of some subpoints here. In chapter 10 of 1 Corinthians, what is it dealing with particularly? In other words, in light of its context. Secondly, let's go beyond chapter 10. What are some very issues that it's dealing with? We can hang on that hook. And then finally, what is the motive that we have to do as this verse commands? So, the first kind of hook we have is in verse 23. It says, all things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, kind of a, I guess a casual paraphrase of that is just because I can doesn't mean I should. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient or beneficial. Now, let's talk about that in light of chapter 10, and then we're going to broaden it out 
and it's going to allow your mind to really chase some rabbits. In chapter 10, two main issues. We've talked about baptism. We've talked about Lord's Supper. And I realize that where I'm about to go creates all kind of doctrinal distinctives, all kinds of discussion and debate, particularly on whatever your respective denominational background is, currently is, online, we're everywhere, whatever that may be. But when it says all things are lawful, but not all things are beneficial. All throughout 1 Corinthians, there has been this encouragement of or admonition of being secure in Christ. That it's not by our works, our deeds, it's by whom he is. All right, so let's talk about those two issues. All things are lawful, but not all things are expedient or beneficial. I'm just going to go there this morning. We're going to unpack it in light of these two issues. You do not have to be sunk underwater to go to heaven. But it's beneficial. I mean, think about that. There, there is no scripture, and I know we could debate this, and I'm not here to debate it. But there is no, in my opinion, scriptural evidence that you, quote, have to be baptized to go to heaven one day. It's not lawful, but it is expedient. It is beneficial. We could even get even within the realm of maybe even this room or this broadcast. There are a lot of people who have a lot of disagreements on how somebody should be baptized. Should we put you all the way under the water? Should we just throw a little bit of water at you? Should we pour some water on you? There's a lot of different ways of expressing it, okay? Again, it is not lawful, or it is lawful, but it's not expedient, meaning this, that one day you're not, and I'm going to pick on my Methodist friends because I love to pick on my Methodist friends. One day you show up to heaven, the Lord's going to go, oh, I'm sorry, you just got sprinkled, you're not getting in. That's not the case. But why is it beneficial? Because our baptism isn't about how much we do or don't get wet or if we do or don't get wet. It is a testimony of what Jesus Christ did for us. Well, he was buried and he rose from the grave. So why would we not want to picture the exact same thing? So again, I've heard this argument all the time. Well, you don't have to be baptized to go to heaven. I'm like, you're absolutely right. But you need to be to picture what Jesus did for you. It's hard to explain it if you don't display it. So again, this issue that has caused so much debate, so much discussion, people say, well, that doesn't determine whether I go to heaven or not. You're absolutely right. But it does determine the picture of your faith that you're giving and the testimony that you have. It's not lawful, but it's, I mean, it is lawful, but it's expedient. You can walk around going, I don't care what the Bible says, I'm not going to do it. You can do that, but it's not beneficial. Now the Lord's Supper. We talked about it last week. I've known people say, well, it's not really important kind of what you use. It's the idea that you have behind it. I've heard people do the Lord's Supper with pizza and Dr. Pepper. And again, if that's what you want to do, God bless you. That's not going to keep you out of heaven. But it really doesn't picture the body and blood of Christ very well. It's not a good representation. It's lawful. You could technically, we could become the first Baptist church of pizza and Dr. Pepper. We could. And it's not going to keep us out of heaven or get us into it. But is it really beneficial? Now, do y'all see kind of the, the idea here? When it says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient or beneficial, I want you to kind of think outside of even those two issues. How many times are we guilty of saying, well, what's the big deal? It's not going to keep me out of heaven. You're right. But is it really beneficial? Is, does it really help communicate the faith? Does it help give you a good conscience toward God or those that are around you? So in general, the idea is regarding Christian liberty. Just because I can doesn't mean I should. Or the opposite, just, just because I can't doesn't mean I should. So let's just kind of go there and have some fun with it this morning. I'm just going to hit a variety of issues that people love to debate, they love to discuss, they love to throw Bible verses around. And again, I'm not picking on anybody, I'm just, this is what I hear. And a lot of people, you may not believe this, based on my personality, people discount my ability to listen. A lot of people think, man, all you do is talk. I'm tired of talking by the time you come to my office, okay? And most people are surprised. You make an appointment, come see me, 99% of the time, you're doing the talking, I'm doing the listening. So all I'm talking about is what I hear, and I hear a whole lot. So in that terminology of, well, you can, but really you should, 
All right, let's talk about some issues. Yeah, you can wear that, but should you wear it? Hey, that I'm talking about a lot of things, but I'm going to go there again, guys. I was there Saturday. And y'all, I heard an uh-huh out there. I was down at the stadium Saturday, and, and it wasn't the question of what they were wearing. It's what they weren't wearing. All right? Now, you guys and ladies, I know you're watching that are raising daughters. God bless you. I don't know how you're doing it. I, re- I really don't. Okay? And y'all heard my phrase. I'm trademarking it. Cover the crease. If you've got a crease on your body, it needs to be covered. Now, there's a lot of places you can have creases and a lot of places that need to be covered. All right? But think about it. There, I mean, you talk about those issues and we've had arguments with our teenagers, boys and girls, by the way. Yeah, you can wear it. And guess what? Wearing that outfit ain't going to keep you out of heaven. But should you do it? That's where this verse is such a hook in our life. You can do it, but really, should you do it? How about this one, guys? You can eat it, but should you? Now, you may not be aware, but there's a significant annual event happening in my, quote, hometown. It's called the Annual State of Texas Fair. Now, we all know about fairs, but the State of Texas Fair is a very unique one. They've got deep fried Oreos for sale. Deep fried butter. I mean, they deep fried cardboard out there. I mean, they they deep fry everything. Now, eating deep fried Oreos ain't going to keep you out of heaven. But think about it. Talk to your doctor. Is that something you really should do? I mean, is that really beneficial to your life? Do you you see what this hook is? It allows you to take a step back and kind of layer it with some things in life and say, well, I know I can eat that. and I know I technically can wear that. I technically can drink that. And I can go there. But is it beneficial? Is it expedient? And I think... And by the way, we like to pick on teenagers about this, but adults were just as bad. You know what the question teenagers love to ask is how far is too far? You do realize that asking that question alone is a bad question. Because you're basically asking, how far can I push grace? How far can I push liberty? How far can I push this line? That's not a good question to ask. Okay, because you're basically saying, how much can I play with fire when it comes to my relationship with the Lord? Can I suggest to you if it looks like fire, don't play with it? Okay, so on this issue of all things are lawful, not everything is expedient or beneficial. That's kind of one of those hooks because we're all guilty of it. Whether it's a very doctrinal issue of baptism with the Lord's Supper, whether it's a practical issue of the way we dress, the places we go, the things we consume, is asking the question, Well, I know I can do it, but should I do it? It won't keep me out of heaven, but will it let me represent heaven well on earth? You kind of see how the balance is there? So what's the motive here? Verse 24, it says, let no man seek his own, but another man's wealth. Now, I'm going to explore that last word here in just a moment. So the purpose of the hook, the, the benefit of the hook is you may have the right, you may have the ability, you may have the quote freedom to do so, but you don't do it because you're concerned about somebody else. Now, let me give you a really practical example here. I'm not picking on you, and I'm not picking on me. As a grown adult, how many times did you not watch a certain show on TV because your kids were in the room? It's not that the show was sinful. It's not that the show was demonic. It's that maybe it had subject matters that would be addressed that are not proper for a six-year-old. And so you just don't do it, right? It's not beneficial to it. Could you do it? Sure. Should you do it? Probably not. You're more interested in the mind of that six-year-old than you are even your own ability to do so. And so that's kind of that mentality here when these issues come up saying, I know that I'm good, I know that I'm fine, but do the people I'm gonna be around, does the audience that's gonna be there, the relationships I have, is this gonna be beneficial? Now at the end, it says another man's, quote, wealth or their life. Some of your Bibles, this is really interesting. Some of your Bibles will actually have the word wealth in italics. Anybody have some italics there with wealth? Okay, some of you do. Why is that important? Those of you who your Bible, it has that word in italics, that is one of those signals 
that that word is not in the quote original languages. Okay? All the italicized words mean that the translators put that word there. It wasn't originally there. They're telling you it wasn't originally there, but they're putting it there to give you some context. Okay? Why is that important? Because if your Bible has an italicized word, it's going to have the word wealth. Well, that's an interesting word. Why would that be the idea? Why, why wealth? Because we think of wealth as financial gain, but it also means one's personal well-being. Now, think about it in terms of well-being. It says, let no man seek his own, but every man another's well-being. When we're walking through these four hooks, kind of the conclusion of all of them is, yes, I have the ability. Yes, I have the quote right. But because of those around me, probably not a good decision. Again, would you allow a six-year-old to just, without any protection at all, to have your power tools? No, because they're not at that level. It's not wise. Can you do it? Sure you can. You can give a six-year-old a circular saw without any instruction. You can do it. Is it beneficial? No, not at all. Same thing goes with what we see, where we go. It's one of those hooks, guys, that this is one of those you put a lot of layers on, all right? Now, the second hook is in verse 26. This one's going to get a little interesting. It says, for the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Both on the front side and the back side of this verse in particular, it's talking about food that has been offered unto idols. And here's kind of the particular interpretation here. That as a believer in Jesus Christ who understands there's only one true God, all these other gods are false gods, they're not real gods. I mean, they may be real spiritual entities, but they are not of a deity. They're not God himself. That it doesn't matter what God's been out there, it doesn't matter what food's been offered, at the end of the day, everything we eat, everything we consume has come from God, the one true God, not that idolatrous thing that's being referenced. We get that. That's not a problem. Let's go to the general part. I've picked two areas here that I thought would be fun for discussion, fun to talk about, areas of life that maybe we've given thought to or not. These are, again, we're talking about hooks here. If everything in the earth is of the Lord and from the Lord and should be honoring to the Lord, it is the fullness thereof. Two areas. Number one, medicine. Now, I'm the son of a pharmacist, so I apologize that medicine has been an active part of my life for a long part of my life. All right. I joke about it. In my home growing up, you didn't cough because if you coughed, you got about six pills. All right, that's how it works in my house. And by the way, when you're the son of a pharmacist, you don't get to stay home sick from school because your dad makes sure you can go to school. All right, they make sure everything's good. Let me tell you another secret. Do you know that as the son of a pharmacist, if you have a minor injury, they will sew you up themselves. I didn't realize you went to the hospital to get sewn up. I thought you just went to the kitchen. I mean, I thought that's what everybody did. That was just kind of the home I grew up in. But let's talk about medicine for just a moment. Now, let me qualify something. I'm not a medical doctor. I'm not a pharmacist. I do not have a degree in biochemistry. But I can read the Bible. The earth is the Lord's in the fullness thereof. That means that every aspect of the earth, and I know we live in a fallen world. I get it. But it was placed there, put there, and allowed to be there by God. Here's where we have issues is when we take those elements and we either A, mix them with other things, or B, use them in a different way than they were naturally intended. Now, I'm very grateful for those of you, there's some of you in the room, I can see your faces. You have a medical background. One of my best friends in the world, at least three times in my life, was anesthesia. Love it. Why? Because I don't want to go through the pain. One of my sons, I won't tell you who he is, but he has two older brothers. One of my sons, had some uh, cavities filled yesterday. Had to go down to the dentist. We had so much fun making fun of him yesterday because half of his mouth was hanging and half of it was fine. But when you go to the dentist, aren't you grateful that they have the ability to put that medicine in your body? Because I don't want to experience that just raw. I don't, I don't like it at all. I'm grateful for it. All those medicinal properties though, 
are being mixed with and utilized and put in a formula to do a certain purpose, right? You do realize that one of the reasons that we have such a medicinal problem, and I'm going extracurricular, I'm going beyond the hospital, I'm talking about what we might call street pharmacists, for lack of better terms, is we're taking God birthed natural elements and we're either mixing them with other things or using them in a different way than they should be utilized. And the beautiful thing is God has given us elements to numb pain. God has given us elements to allow surgical procedures to happen in a manner that can be successful when they last eight hours. The problem is when we say, oh, I know God's given us that stuff, but I want to use it in a way to please my flesh and not just have a surgical procedure. Again, it's one of those hooks. Just because God gave it to us doesn't mean we can use it any way we want to. There's a strategic way. And when we start talking about some of these medicinal items, a lot of the problem is when we take natural numbing devices and we mix them with other things and we become very recreational. Y'all see where I'm going with this, right? You do realize every recreational medicinal property has a God-given purpose that can be used for good. But what do we do? Like humanity always does. We twist it. We turn it. The, I've heard people say, well, it came from the, the ground. It's okay. Well, maybe not in the way that you're using it. You see how that hook is? Just because you can defend it came from God doesn't mean you're using it the right way. Okay? Now, how about the dietary laws? Now, you say, what do you mean dietary laws? Well, I'm going to kind of flip the script a little bit. Hopefully, you have access to go a few pages to the right. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. Now, I know that we are here in Alabama. There's people watching from all over the world. But for those of you who are here, you're going to like what you're about to read. All right? Now, there may be some folks that don't, but it's going to be good. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 says, Now the Spirit speaks expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, push pause. That's a pretty serious accusation, right? We're not just saying God unwise, making poor decisions. Seducing spirits, doctrines of devil, verse 2. Speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. That's pretty rough. Verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good. And nothing to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. Why is that critical to the discussion? Because there are actually people today that will try to put a guilt trip on you and say, oh, if you really believe the Bible, if you really believe Jesus, man, you, you cannot eat brisket. Nope, nope, Jesus was a vegetarian. You need to be a vegetarian too. Now, if you haven't heard these people, I will invite you to Anaheim the second week of June of next year. You say, what's in Anaheim the second week of June? It's the Southern Baptist Convention. And there will be people who will protest the Southern Baptist Convention over dietary laws and claim that if you, quote, eat meat, that you can't be a real Bible believer. I'm not making this stuff up. And we live in a world today. The other day, I was at a, uh, an environment where I was distributing food. Now, I know we're in a college town, I get it. And I know college is one of those places where we like to expand our minds and think a little differently. So here we are distributing food. I was just doing what I was doing. And I had a young lady, I know she was teasing, but she was halfway serious. She said, you mean you don't have the option of tofu? And I said, no ma'am, we're in Alabama. We don't have that here. Uh, I, I said, I apologize, okay? But again, the, the, the point in this, when it says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, that doesn't mean that we can go gorge on a buffet of deep fried Oreos. Okay? But at the same time, the Bible makes it clear that in the last days, the latter days, there are going to be people with seducing spirits trying to tell you you can't eat meat. That it's somehow, it, it's, it's of the devil, it's wrong. It's, guys, what does it say in that, that last verse we read? With thanksgiving. You know what that means? That means if you pray over it, you're okay. Now, 
When I say pray over it, I don't just mean huma, 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 I'm good, God. I mean, you actually pray, may this edify my body. May this benefit my body. Hey, I've told you all this before, guys. I'll tell you again. When I go on some of these mission trips, I really pray over my food. I pray, God, don't let it kill me. And please let it taste like chicken. That's, that's my prayer. If you go on a mission trip with me and you hear me pray that prayer, that's a sincere prayer. I'm not being, I'm not being funny. Because I've sat down over some food that I, man, I could almost swear was moving. Okay? And I didn't know what it was made of and I really questioned the source. But nonetheless, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So again, what's the motive here? Verse 29 talks about our conscience. And not just our conscience with our own walk with the Lord, but our conscience toward other people. Now, let me kind of take a bridge here. We have been, at least on Sunday mornings, going through the Gospel of Mark, talking about our freedom in Christ, that He's come to set us free. On this issue that we're talking about, the earth is the Lord's, the fullness thereof, I think there's two cliffs that we tend to fall off of. There are some people that try to put others in bondage. You can't eat that, or you shouldn't eat that. Or, no, 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 that, that's not proper. Well, we just read that seducing spirits doctrine of devils. On the other side, there are people that say, hey, man, do it all. You can do anything you want. No, 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 no. In other words, again, it's the adding to or the using for a different purpose uh, therein. And by the way, again, I realize I'm not an expert in the area, but when it comes to medicinal items, when it comes to food items, you do realize that most of the food that you will consume when you read the ingredients isn't just that one item. There's all kinds of other items that have been added to it. Again, that item in its original state of the earth of the Lord, but we can take it, we can twist it, we can turn it, you get the point. Go down to verse 31, the third hook. This is one of those, if you don't have it memorized, you probably should. There's a parallel passage in Colossians 3. It says, what, whether therefore you eat or you drink, or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. That, my friends, is a hook. All right? Whatever you do, do to the glory of God. Now, particularly here, it's talking about food offered unto idols. Okay? It's in that same context there. So don't overly express one's liberty. Don't fall into bondage. We get that. Let's talk about general things here. All that you do, do to the glory of God. The parallel passage is Colossians 3, 20 through 23. Where it says that everything in our life ought to be done to honor the Lord. So, let's walk through these things. That means that one of the hooks in your life, if I'll go back up, is just because you can doesn't mean you should. Another hook is, hey, it's all come from the Lord, but I shouldn't add to it or twist it or turn it to make it just self-satisfying. The third hook is this. Everything we do, we do to the Lord. So, let's just walk through some subject matters here. Let's talk about our homes. Let, let's make, make it personal. Our homes and our family. Okay? We ought to have a marriage as unto the Lord. We ought to have children as unto the Lord. What does that mean? Guys, that means you should not act to or say anything to your spouse that you wouldn't say directly to the face of God. Oops. That hurts. But you don't understand what she said to me. What does it say here? Whatever you do, do as unto the Lord. I got news for you. You know, they said some pretty mean things to Jesus too. Remember what he said? Father, forgive them. They know not what they're doing. How about your kids? Now, I understand the Bible gives an example, particularly in Hebrews 12, about we discipline our kids like the Lord disciplines us. I get all that. But we ought to raise our kids as if unto the Lord. Let's expand it a little bit more. How about your job? I know we have a retirement section over here to my left, but just pretend you're still working. Um, but your job or your retirement, as unto the Lord. By the way, some of you laugh because the retirement section is not just over here. Y'all are sprinkling about here. Think about your job. How many times do we gripe, we whine, we moan, we complain about who either A, the supervisor is, or for those of you who are the boss, who the employee is? All right? And you're always rah, 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 as unto the Lord. We ought to run our company as if the owner of it was God himself. 
we ought to do our job, whatever our job is, as if our annual evaluation is done by God himself. Now, I know what you may be thinking. I don't think God really cares about whatever it is you do for a living. It may not be what you do. It's how and why you do it. Do everything as unto the Lord. Let me go a little bit further out. How about our hobbies, our recreation, what we do with our free time ought to be done as if unto the Lord. Now, I'm going to kind of go there because it's important to me and my family. We're kind of a sports family. If y'all didn't know that, we like it. One of the reasons I like sports is because it's in the Bible a whole lot. You said it is? Oh, absolutely. Paul talks about wrestling, fighting, and running. That's sports, is it not? It may not be baseball and basketball, but sports nonetheless. And the famous verse that says, for all of sin and fall short of the glory of God, you realize when it says that we've all come short, that's actually an archery term for missing the target. So lots of sports in the Bible. Number two, sports teach lessons that you cannot learn in the classroom. It's really hard to learn some of those lessons in the classroom that you learn on a respective sports field, whatever it may be. But let's talk about that for a moment. Do all things as unto the Lord. Can I really talk to you for a moment? I don't know if my kids are watching or not, but let me really talk to you about why I love sports. Here are the lessons. Because we've all been at a practice where we just wanted to give the coach a piece of our mind. Y'all been there. You know what I'm talking about, right? Some of y'all heard this story. Absolutely true. I wish it wasn't. I was playing baseball. It was at my coach that I, that I did all my baseball with. He believed that at the end of a three-hour practice, you needed to run until you couldn't move anymore. That's what he believed in, okay? He was old school, all right? So at the end of practice, you know, we'd run through first base five or six times, we'd make a turn, we'd do a couple of doubles, then we'd run it all the way in, all right? If at any point you did not do it the proper way, he would make you go and run a lap around the whole complex, come back and redo it, okay? So we're doing our thing. I'm frustrated, I'm tired. If you haven't noticed, I'm not built as a runner. Okay, this is not the build of a runner. If you need me to knock over the catcher, got you covered, all right? But running's kind of not my thing. So we're running out doubles, and I'm doing what I'm supposed to do, but guys, I'm not doing it with a good attitude. I'm not, I don't wanna be doing it. So I go, I hit second base, I'm jogging back to home plate. My coach looks at me and says, Myers, give me two. Now remember what the punishment was, one, right? He gave me two. I said, coach, why'd I have to run two laps? He said, for cussing me out. I said, whoa, coach, I didn't say a word. He goes, nope, it was in your eyes. Give me two. <laughs> My attitude was less than desirable. I didn't want to be there. I wasn't happy about it. Do everything. What is it? All things, whatsoever you do as under the Lord. Running to second base, you ought to do it as if the Lord's the one who told you to do it. Now, guys, I'm not trying to make sports something more than it is. What I'm trying to give as an example is everything we do, okay? Guys, the men's Bible study. I know ladies are watching. How about that honey-do list you get? Mmm, yes. Do that unto the Lord. As if the Lord himself said, this is what I need you to do and pick up. Everything we do. Here's what our, our problem is. We say, well, that's just work, or that's just this, or that's just that. Oh, when I'm at church, whoo, God's got it all. Whatsoever you do, do it as unto the Lord. And let me go ahead and tell you, it'll be the smallest things that are the hardest things. So I'm just a big believer that when you mow your grass, you ought to mow your grass as if it's the Lord's lawn. If you have the privilege of playing a sport, you ought to play it as if the Lord's the coach. All right. If you get somebody to give you instructions on what to do in a certain area at work, you ought to do it as if God is your supervisor. Everything you do, do it as under the Lord. Here's the problem. We say, well, it doesn't matter. It's only so-and-so that told me to do it. Whatsoever you do. Why? Look at the motive here. So you give no offense. And it gives categories to the Jew, the Gentile, and the church. Now that's interesting because the Jews as a whole were the lost world but religious. The Gentiles were lost but pagans. And then of course, of course the church is the group of believers. Basically, it's saying that if we do everything, everything 
as if the Lord Himself is the one that commissioned it, then we're not going to, quote, offend anybody. Now, I want to draw a distinction. There's a difference between offending and being offensive. The message of Jesus Christ is offensive to the world. Okay? You can't discount that. But the way you live it out should be non-offensive. In other words, they may not appreciate whom you believe in, but they cannot discount how you live it out. In other words, I don't like that they believe in Jesus. I don't like they stand on the truth of God's word, but I can't discount the fact they're my best employee. They got the best attitude and they're always willing to help anybody out. Usually, guys, I'm just going to go there. Most of us Christians are not known as the best employee with the best attitude helping anybody out. A lot of times we're known as the grumpy ones trying to take advantage of situations. Whatsoever you do. Do you notice these little hooks? There's a lot of layers. A lot of layers. And then the last one. Then we'll close out. Verse 32 or 3. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. In other words, the, the particularness, it, it's kind of wrapping up this whole chapter is, do not gain advantage by fault or demise of others. Let me go back to the sports world for just a moment. We should never, and this is going to be tough, guys, because a lot of y'all are sports people. We should never celebrate when the other team gets hurt. We should never celebrate we win because they lost key players or because they made mistakes. We should, quote, celebrate because we just played our best, if that makes sense. In other words, he's saying, my, not my own profit, that, you know, I shouldn't walk around hoping that others fail so I succeed by default. That's the particularness here. In other words, oh, you know what, I'm glad I got that contract because, you know, my competition, man, he's clueless. He doesn't know what he's doing. Poor guy can't find his head if he had to. No, we ought to celebrate that I got the contract because I did it as unto the Lord and he honored it. You see the difference there, right? Never cheer. Here's the best thing. Never cheer when the other team gets hurt. That's the, the particular. In general here, love, charity, 1 Corinthians 13. We'll get there in a few chapters. This attitude, this idea that others and their needs are more important or more significant than my own. Staying in the sports world, because that's where my mind typically goes. We've all seen the videos of shortstops helping, now this isn't a softball one I'm thinking about, where shortstops helping another girl get around the bases because she pulled a muscle after hitting a home run. We've seen runners in the Olympics stop their own race to help other people cross the line. We've seen those videos. They're heartfelt videos. We love those videos. Why? Because again, it's not what I desire as much as what the other person needs. Here's the motive. I put this on there. Hang your hat on this one. Salvation of the lost should be more important than success in life. Guys, here's this final hook here. We talk about, yeah, I know I can, but should I? I know it's from the Lord, but should I use it in that way? Man, I should do everything as unto the Lord. But here's really what this final hook here is. You and I live in a lost world where the overwhelming majority of people are headed to hell. And hopefully, you're one, as I am, that's headed to heaven. And those of us headed to heaven ought to be more concerned about those headed to hell than what we can do on our way to heaven. Now, I'm going to give you, I'm going to kind of change it up a little bit. I'm going to close with a little phrase that I grew up with in my home. Now, this came from my mama. I know it's a men's Bible study. She may even be watching. I don't know. Here's the statement. Okay, on an issue. And by the way, you can fill in the blank on so many things we've talked about. She used to tell me, well, well, son, that may not be a problem for you, but that might help send somebody else to hell. Now, that'll get your attention. In other words, well, I have the right to do that. I have the freedom to do that. Yeah, that may not send you to hell, but it may help send somebody else. Now, guys, that's a good last hook to hang your head up. You know what? I know I'm headed to heaven. I know I'm a believer. But is that really the testimony that I want the lost world to see? Probably not. Now, hooks. 
go full circle, layers. Your garage, you put all those tools on them, boom, it falls off the wall. There are so many layers here, guys, because your life is your life, mine is mine. Use these hooks today, use these hooks going forward to say, all right, there's a whole lot of stuff out there that I can put on these when it comes to living out my faith. Four incredible hooks. Let me encourage you, make these a part of your life. I'm gonna pray us out of here. We're gonna eat some more biscuits. Sound good? Lord Jesus, thank you for the challenge of your word. Thank you for the conviction of your word. God, we come to you as men and even ladies online. God, we admit and we claim that we struggle. We have difficulties. But God, you've made it very clear that you've given us a way to do life, a means to do it, and even today the hooks we're to put life on. Help us today, God, before we make excuses, God, before we justify, help us to think of what your opinion is and how this will impact others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Go get them. Grab a biscuit. Unless you're online, you got to cook your own. Plenty of biscuits. Plenty of biscuits.